Good morning. Good morning. Mm. With all our welcome and announcements, I think you guys can read it better than I can. Uh, <clears throat> gotta get my glasses on. But I have an announcement for you that's not in the bulletin, or not up there. Uh, Mike and Sarah Bennett are hosting a graduation party for their grandson, Michael. It will be at the church on Saturday uh, from 1 to 4. So if anybody would like to see Cassie and her family, and trust me, it's tough. She's been going on how many years? I've seen her once. So she's fast. <laughs> Just, Cassie and her family, please come for a sandwich and a cake next Saturday in the fellowship hall, 1 to 4. Updating the uh, announcements, uh, updating the directory, be over here. I'll let you guys read it. You can read it better than me. Turn it around, it hurts my neck. And uh, we're gonna need volunteers to help distribute uh, on August the 6th, uh, uh, you know, 6th and 7th supplies. Jim's gonna be on vacation July 22nd through 28th. Uh, Reverend Ann Watson will be on call for par uh, pastoral emergencies. <clears throat> be a blessing. Pray often, be kind, give thanks. Do good, have courage. Lead with love, practice peace, be the light, work for justice, courage others, and be joyful. A beautiful message, isn't it? Okay. It, time for the prelude. Are we? Time for the prelude. Yeah, I
Leave duty, duty behind. Come and sit. Be still and listen to the word of God. Leave me to do the worry at the door. Enter this peaceful place. Allow yourself to relax and prepare for worship. Let go and come to the quiet center. and worship.
Now it's a time in our worship for the message for the young and the young at heart. The book you see up on the screen is a book I read uh, many, many years ago at a time in my life when I was so busy doing things and yet I wasn't focusing on the things that I said were important to me. And that book really helped me try to get my, my focus. Um, I was so busy doing things that were keeping me busy that, I, like I said, I didn't really pay attention to the things that I said were important. Things like spending time with God, spending time in prayer, um, and just kind of like taking care of myself. And it's kind of like <clears throat> all those busy things are like this jar of sand. All the busy things that we do, if we put those things first, and then the golf ball represents God or the things that we say are important in our life, if we try to do all these things first without focusing on this, it doesn't fit. We can't get God in there. We, are, we can't get the things that we say are important to us. And we're going to hear a story from the Bible today about two sisters, Martha and Mary. And Martha invited Jesus to come to dinner, but then when they got there, Mary sat at Jesus' feet and Martha got busy doing stuff. She's preparing the meal, setting the table, cleaning the house. And then she started getting upset at Mary, who wasn't helping her. But Martha forgot the whole reason why she invited Jesus in to have dinner to begin with, and that was to be able to spend time with him. <clears throat> and Jesus tried really hard to get Martha to see how distracted she was from the one thing that was really important, the whole reason she invited Jesus in. So our lives are kind of like this empty jar. And if we take the things that we say are important, if we take God and put God first, everything fits. So it's important in our lives to put those things that we say are important, focus on those first, and then there'll be time and space for the rest. Let's pray. Holy and living God, we are so grateful for you and your love of us. And we know that you especially love us when we let those things that just take over our lives, take over our lives, and we forget about you. And there's nothing more that you want in the world than for us to be happy and to know that we are loved. So help us, God, to always put you first and to put the things that we say are important to us first in our lives and then everything else will come together. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. We don't have any special music again this morning and I, I want to thank um, Sally Myers for uh, once again filling the, the bench, the organ bench for us. Um, this is the time in our worship service when we lift any special joys or concerns that we may have about things going on in our lives or the lives of those um, we love and care for or even things just going on in the world, in our community that seem to be tugging at our hearts that we'd like to step back from all the busyness of our day and lift in prayer. I'll try to summarize each of those things that you raise and say, Lord, in your mercy, and ask that you respond here our prayer and then I'll follow that with a pastoral prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. So are there any special joys or concerns that we can lift up this morning? Yes. Jeff Bouchard, Bouchard, for the family of Jeff Bouchard, who died unexpectedly at the age of 62, and for his family, Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Oh, I haven't heard that either. Sarah said that she heard on the news this morning that there had been something like 600 deaths 
in Europe um, caused by wildfires. Lord, in your mercy. I'd also like to lift up Mark Trinko, um, who is now being transferred to um, a nursing home uh, for um, some physical therapy um, so we can gain his strength back, and for Mary, who is caring for him. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And continued prayers for Jerry Richard, who is recovering from his automobile accident, making some progress, and prayers also for Toby and the rest of the Richard family as Jerry continues his journey to health. Lord, in your mercy. So let's spend a few moments lifting all these prayers that we have heard and gathering them together with those prayers that we still hold within our hearts and our minds and lift them up to God in a time of silence, knowing that God hears and knows our deepest concerns and our greatest joys, even when we struggle to bring those to our lips. God, there are many ways to serve you and so many needs in our world. So we ask you to show us your unique calling on our life. Remind us that we do not need to be like others, that you have created us as individuals, all with different gifts that together contribute to the beauty of your creation. May we celebrate diversity each and every day, recognizing how that contributes to the richness of your world and of our experience in it. In celebrating difference, may we work in harmony with one another. And God, we ask you to show us how we might best serve you in loving all that you have created. May we never be discouraged by all the need that we see, but rather be encouraged all the more to give what we have, knowing that we can make a difference. And may we always work alongside and encourage others as together we, get, we begin to be the change that we wish to see in the world for love's sake. All this we pray as we pray in the way that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Well, as we work to be the church in the world, St. John United Church of Christ relies on your offerings to be able to do things like offering this building um, for the community and, and empowering me, your pastor, to support the community and the efforts um, being made to ensure that everyone in God's creation so at this time, I ask you to take a few moments to prepare an envelope to drop in the offertory plates that are located at each of the entrances to the sanctuary, or if you're at home, to prepare an envelope to drop in the mail to send it in. Or you can use our tithely account as shown on the screen, um, at the bottom of the screen, or connect directly with our tithely account through the QR code that's on the screen to offer your gifts electronically. And you can also set up um, 
regular offerings, like once a month if you want, through the tithe account. And you can also do that through your bank if you're um, interested. So bring your gifts and your talents. Bring your sacrifice of praise to God. Bring them with prayers and shouts of thanksgiving to celebrate God's faithfulness. lift your voices together with mine in the dedication of these gifts to God's work. God, you have gifted us all differently. May we always be willing to offer ourselves to you to complete your work of love on earth until all are one in you. Amen.
my glasses on. <clears throat> oh God, as the scriptures are read and the gospel proclaimed, open our ears to your word, to hear your word, open our eyes to see your truth, and open our hearts to receive your grace. Amen. Uh, this reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, the New Revised Standard Version, uh, the updated edition. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Holy Spirit breathes into us these words. When Laurel and I have someone over for dinner, I'm usually in the kitchen preparing the food. And I'm not complaining, because I like to cook. And frankly, the introverted side of me likes the isolation of the kitchen, especially when there's a, a big crowd. I also know that Laurel, on the other hand, is an extrovert and would rather be engaging our guests in conversation and activity. So we, we're a good balance. But I know that there comes a time when I simply need to finish or, or set aside the work that I'm doing to, to join in in the gathered community. I mean, after all, the reason we invite people over for dinner is to build relationships and to share our journey through life together. There always has to be a balance between doing and being, between work and word. And balance is something Jesus was aware of as a necessary part of life. And most of us may not realize that because we only hear a limited number of stories about Jesus in the readings on, on Sundays, in most of which he's found engaging the disciples or the crowds or the religious authorities of his day. I mean, Jesus was a teacher, after all, a, a rabbi. And a big part of what he did was talking and sharing the scriptures and their meanings with all those people who were gathered around him. But as any good teacher or pastor will tell you, time alone for study, for preparation, for reflection are important elements of successful teaching and preaching, as is the time to just simply enjoy life and replenish the soul. Now there are many pastors Jesus knew that in order to be able to give of the Spirit, he needed time to replenish the Spirit within himself. Well, last week we discussed Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, which included the story of the Good Samaritan. And as we discussed last week, to have a good neighbor, you must be one. And to be a good neighbor is to show compassion, to live God's love. In the process of living God's love, we find ourselves living an eternal life, living God's life. And that's really how the legal expert interpreted the scripture when he said that to love God with your entire being and to love your neighbor as yourself is the way to eternal life. And it is why Jesus said to him, do this and you will live. It's a message behind the Samaritan showing compassion and why Jesus said to the legal expert, go and do the same. Well, today's story of Martha and Mary follows fast on the heels of that story. And it's important to think about the discussion Jesus had with the legal expert since it sets the context for the story. Loving our neighbor, having compassion for one another is an important part of living God's love, of what's really important being the church and loving God and loving your neighbor. The stuff we get busy doing
can get in the way of being the church and get in the way of loving God and loving our neighbor. So the scriptures tell us that while Jesus and the disciples were traveling together after the discussion with the legal expert, Jesus entered a certain village and was welcomed into the home of a woman named Martha. Now Luke doesn't really tell us a whole lot about Martha other than she had a sister, Mary. In the Gospel of John, we also find um, Martha and Mary mentioned, but John tells us that they're the sisters of Lazarus, the man whom Jesus brought back to life in the Gospel of John. And we have no way of knowing whether it's the same Martha and Mary that we find in Luke, since Luke doesn't ever mention Lazarus with respect to this story. But since Luke tells us that Martha welcomed Jesus in and not Lazarus or some other man, it's likely that Martha was the head of the household, the person upon whom the responsibility for hospitality for guests would fall. And as the story is told to us in Luke, we find Martha's sister Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening intently to him. Now from our perspective, reading this and hearing this through the lens of the 21st century, it doesn't sound all that extraordinary to us to have Mary sitting and listening to Jesus, does it? But you need to think about the context. In the time of Jesus, what Mary was doing, sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to him, well, that was what a disciple would do, a follower of a religious teacher would do. The problem is that Mary was taking a position reserved only for males in first century Palestine. So not only was Mary apparently shirking her duties by not helping with the preparation of the food, part of the duty of showing hospitality to guests and, and something women of the household would be expected to do in that time. But Mary was also bringing shame upon her family by assuming a role reserved for men in that time. But note that Jesus welcomed Mary. But Martha, presumably the older sister, got upset. Well, my family didn't have a dishwasher until I was about 10. So every night after supper, all the kids over the age of 10, I lucked out, would, would have had to take turns washing and then drying the dishes before putting them back in the cupboard where they belonged. You see, there were, there were eight of us at that time in a very small house in Detroit, so there wasn't enough room on the counter to let all those dishes air dry. They had to be dried and put away as soon as they were rinsed. Now, some of my siblings really hated doing dishes, and even more so, hated doing them with other specific members of the family. And if you come from a big family, I'm sure you know all about sibling rivalries. Well, in certain circles, and I'm not going to name names, arguments often erupted about washing and drying, which, at least in my memory, included repeated attempts to try to pull my parents into the fray. And for those of you with any knowledge of family systems theory, that's called triangulation. Now there's one story I remember hearing of my older siblings. I've heard a couple of versions of the story, but one version went something like this. Mom, she's not washing the dishes right. They're still dirty. Nah, they're clean. She just doesn't want to dry them. And so it went kind of back and forth as the two desperately tried to drag my mom to come in and inspect the washed and dried dishes. They both expected my mom to take sides, or maybe it was a ploy to try to get my mom just to throw up her hands and do it herself. Now, in one version of the story that I've heard, my dad got so upset that my sisters were arguing and trying to pull my mom into the argument that he went into the kitchen took all of the plates and the cups and dishes out of the cupboard, as well as those in the dish rack, waiting to be dried, and put them back in the soapy water in the sink, and told my siblings, wash and dry them all again, and if I hear one more peep from either of you, you'll wash and dry them again. Well, as best as I can remember of the story, all the dishes were washed and dried and put away in silence, and quickly. 
Now, some people claim that the Bible is the literal word of God, as if God directly directed it to the writers. Now, I find this problematic on so many different levels. I mean, first, the books often referred to as the Old Testament by Christians, the, the Hebrew Bible, were written in ancient Hebrew, which was written without vowels or punctuation. The reader must determine which vowels to use and where the sentences end. And sometimes the reader can interpret the verse in a different way by selecting different vowels. And I was reminded of this a couple weeks ago when, when a, a UCC devotional came up about the story of Rahab. Now in the description of Rahab, the consonants in the Hebrew Bible are Z and H, which are, were used to describe her in Hebrew. Now with one set of vowels, Z and H, can be interpreted to mean that Rahab was a prostitute. With a different set of vowels, it can be interpreted to mean that Rahab was an innkeeper. British historian Josephus, who wrote a book called The Antiquities of the Jews in the late first century, right about the time of the writing of the Gospels, indicated in his history book that Rahab kept an inn. So which was it? I mean, she could have been an innkeeper and a prostitute, but why is it that Christians always interpreted it as she was a prostitute? Now, another issue with literalism is that we read the Bible in modern English. And having studied the German language a little bit, I can say with confidence that there is no such thing as direct translation. There is only interpretation. In verse 40, as we heard in our selection today from the New Life Standard Version, tells us that Martha was distracted by her own task. Now, the English word distracted does give us some indication that it was more than Martha simply being busy. And the Greek word that was interpreted in English as distracted actually carries a much stronger meaning. It, it implies that, that Martha was being pulled away or dragged in many different directions. So it could be interpreted that Martha was, in fact, not being a good host because she wasn't paying attention to her guest. Now, putting together a meal is a hospitable gesture. But if the work gets in the way of being a good host, maybe it's just too much. Perhaps Martha was feeling guilty about her failure to be a good host. Perhaps she was upset that Mary was shaming the family by acting in a way than what was different than what was expected for a woman at the time. Perhaps she was simply trying to pull Jesus into something that she needed to resolve herself, trying to triangulate Jesus into the relationship with Mary. But Jesus wouldn't have any of that. He said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. Well, if you've never been to the United Church of Christ General Synod, it happens every two years right now on, on odd number years. So the next one will be in 2023. And I think someone told me it might be St. Louis, but I'm not sure about that. But if you've never been to a general synod, it's, it's quite the experience. I've been to five general synods and was a delegate from our, our uh, conference for two of them, 2011 and 2013. And as a delegate, the Tahis were really long. We typically start at 7 a.m. with a meeting with all the other conference delegates, and then would often go till 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Now, it wasn't continuous work. A typical day was a mixture of business, worship, and workshops with some free time thrown in. But as a delegate, it was very intense. Now, as a guest just there, you can pick and choose what you, you know, want to participate in and go. It's a, it's a completely different experience than being a delegate. But I remember talking to my roommate at the first General Synod in which I was a delegate, and, and I made the comment to him that I, I thought, you know, the General Synod could be a lot shorter if we just focused on the business that needed to get done. But he argued that he thought the other experiences were just as important, if sometimes, if not more important than the, just the business meetings. 
And I thought about the story of Martha and Mary when thinking about that, and it, and it put his thoughts and his words in perspective for me, especially as I reflected upon the, the, the wonderful worship services at, at Synod and the connections I made with people from all over the United States who were part of the United Church of Christ or affiliated somehow with our denomination. And just from simply understanding the diversity of the United Church of Christ. It is important to do the business of church, but it's just as important to find God in that activity. It's just as important to be the church in the company of others, giving praise and honor to God. It's just as important to tend to relationships. I mean, how often do we get caught up in doing the things in the church that we've always done, keeping busy doing the things that we think need to get done without stopping to think about why we're here or how what we are or should be doing contributes to the building of God's kingdom? How often do we focus so much on the activities that we do that we fail to take the time to look for God at work, that we fail to listen to what the Holy Spirit may be telling us? How often does the busyness of our lives detract from experiencing the building of God's kingdom in our midst from being the church? As Jesus reminded Martha, there was need of only one thing. He said, choose the better part, for it won't be taken away from us. Yes, there is work to be done, but it's important to take the time to be fed by the word. Word and work belong together. May we never forget that, and may we always take the time to sit at the feet of Christ and listen. And may we take the time to see the connection between word and work. And may we find the work God is calling us to do and be the church in every aspect of our lives. Amen. I invite you to join together with me to pray the prayer as shown on the screen. Teach us, O oh God, that different is not less than. For you have created us all differently, all gifted, all with something to bring to serve you by serving each other. So may we value the differences you have created, the noisy and the quiet, the fast and the slow, the thinkers and the doers, the listeners and the talkers, the teachers and the learners, knowing that we are all loved and that we all have much to give in serving you by loving one another. May we use all our gifts to make the world a better place for all. Amen.
Working and resting, God is, God is with us. Speaking and listening, God is with us. Hoping and dreaming, God, God is, is with us. Our worship has ended. Now our service begins. Thank you.